Hi, everyone. This is Mike Wilkerson. I'm the founder of Stormwall Advisors, the host of Stormwall.com, and the author of Why America Matters. Uh, today is Tuesday, May 2nd. This is the Stormwall Advisors monthly update for the month of May, and we're here to talk about uh, the banking crisis, which continues on. So before we jump into it, if uh, you're watching this on YouTube, if uh, you would please like it, share it, subscribe it, uh, greatly appreciate it. And uh, let's jump right into this. So I'm going to share my screen here, go through uh, some slides with you. Bear with me. Here I, here I go. I think this will do it. All right. So how would that work? So I want to talk about what's just happened in the market. Some news today or yesterday, uh, big surprise uh, for some in, in government, maybe not for others, but another top 20 bank in the U.S. has failed. Uh, this has got to be frustrating for uh, uh, Chairman Jerome Powell of the Federal Reserve and for others. Uh, but let's quickly go through what happened. So First Republic, a regional bank, not unlike Silicon Valley Bank, 13th largest in the U.S., they had a deposit run that was similar to Silicon Valley Bank last month. They did receive $30 billion in emergency funding from a consortium uh, of 11 banks. It was led by J.P. Morgan, and they hired Lazard, my former employer, to explore strategic alternatives, in other words, to try to find a buyer. Uh, a month later, no announcement about a sale, but they did announce in a shocking piece of news in their first quarter, they had lost $104 billion, one-third of their total deposits uh, over the course of that quarter, so really significant losses. Uh, deposit flight, and as a solve, the intention to sell up to 100 billion of assets uh, and basically try to start over. This news really shocked the market. The deposit flight resumed. The shares tanked. Uh, over the next few days, it was pretty clear that they were not going to survive. And so the FDIC prepared to place First Republic in receivership. They sought bids over this past weekend from other banks. JP Morgan uh, ended up announcing the acquisition of most of the assets, but entering into a loss sharing deal. Uh, with uh, with with JP Morgan. Uh, all in all, 22 billion in equity value destroyed. If you go back and think about where we were in mid-March, just a few weeks ago, right after Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said that our banking system is sound. And I'm not sure people are believing her now if they did at the time. The equity market certainly did it, didn't believe her. Uh, the banking sector, regional banks were down some 30%. Uh, over the course of the last two months. If you look at the names, I mean, even the big banks got hit a bit, but these regional banks really got hammered across the board uh, with names like Truist, Key Corp, Comerica, Zions, Western Alliance, uh, Pacific West. And of course, we don't show First Republic or uh, or Silicon Valley Bank on there because they go to zero uh, in essence or pretty close to it. Even top five rated US bank down 28% over this time, pretty significant losses. We'll come back to that in a second. It's really important to make the point that this is unprecedented. We've had three of the four largest bank failures ever occur in the last two months. You have to go back to Washington Mutual in 2008, sixth largest bank at the time with 300 billion of assets in the global financial crisis. These three banks, First Republic, Silicon Valley Signature, some 500 billion in uh, total assets, 560 or so, and uh, three of the, of the four largest ever. This whole process is not just spooked the equity markets, but foreign investors. So those who invest in money market funds that in turn invest in bank securities, uh, we've seen a $72 billion outflow, according to the SEC, over the course of, of March, which is really, really dramatic. So this is spooking a lot of people. Moody's, the credit rating agency, uh, has taken note. They've downgraded the banking sector as a whole pointing out higher interest rates, funding risks, deteriorating credit quality, reduced profits, and thus capital, and then emerging risks related to commercial real estate. All of these brought it, bringing down the sector in their view, and they did target a certain number of banks, including uh, some of the names we've mentioned before, U.S. Bank, which was a bit of, of a surprise given how large they are, given uh, their perceived strength, $680 billion in assets, fifth largest, $510 billion of deposits, uh, but Moody's pointed out, relatively low capitalization. It is also true they do have some exposure to commercial real estate, which we'll come back to in a bit. And uh, unrealized losses, like a lot of the, the sector plus, they're trying to integrate uh, a merger and acquisition of uh, Mitsubishi uh, uh, Financial Group in December. So interesting turn of events. Now, Jamie Diamond, following the announcement of his firm, JP Morgan Chase's acquisition of most of the assets of First Republic, 
had some strong statements for the investors on the call and for the general public, which is reaffirming uh, his view that the American banking system is extraordinarily sound, that the crisis is, this part at least, is essentially over. Nothing's really changed about the odds of a recession, and this doesn't have anything to do with um, the global financial crisis of 2008. Now, it's interesting to note as well that JP Morgan now holds 10% of all U.S. deposits. Um, while they've always been a too big to fail bank, you could say they're now the indispensable bank, at least from the perspective of the U.S. government, taking actions that the Federal Reserve is not able or allowed or, or uh, uh, under law uh, able to do. However, even with Jamie Dimon's comments, who's very well respected on Wall Street, one of the most experienced bankers uh, out there, uh, Marcus didn't didn't buy it. So investors dumped the regional banks the day after the announcement. Um, this is on top of the losses I showed just a second ago. And again, it's really these regional banks that are getting hit hard. And the fear here is that the deposit runs are not over. Look at what's happened. We've lost a trillion dollars of deposits from the U.S. banks since a year ago. And this data is a couple of weeks old. It does not reflect whatever's happened in the last week if people have become concerned again in the wake of First Republic. This is an ongoing issue. Uh, the problem underlying all this is that the bank deposits are now, banks are basically uncompetitive with the market rates. So the Fed raised rates over and over again over the course of the past year. One year treasuries now yielding just under 5%. Treasury money markets, four and a half net of fees. And you take it down to your bank, and on average across the U.S., your savings account is getting 24, 24 uh, basis points. Uh, one year bank CD is getting 1.7, and going back to J.P. Morgan, their savings rates today are 0.01. So um, customers are waking up to this; they're realizing it. So we have both fear and greed working: greed of getting a, a better rate, but also real fear that the sector is not uh, safe and not stable. So these same cash star banks are turning to the home loan banks, which is the system of banks set up across the U.S. for this kind of situation. They've had a, a trillion dollars advanced to the banks uh, at the end of March. That's a huge increase from a year ago, a third, up one third, uh, and I think an all time all time record. Not only that, they're also tapping the Federal Reserve's emergency funding, something we haven't seen. We saw it a little bit in uh, lockdowns in 2020. And then, of course, in the global financial crisis, but nowhere near the magnitude we're seeing today. So over $325 billion uh, borrowed at the end of April, just last week, uh, through these programs. The bank profit model, as a result, is completely broken. So they're losing their deposits or they're not able to pay enough on them. They're having to borrow from the government uh, institutions. Those government institutions are charging market rates 5%. That is going to kill bank profitability unless, again, the Fed... Uh, pivots, returns course, and starts to lower interest rates again. Uh, the regional banks really have no good alternative to this. And of course, the underlying problem that we talked about last time is that the U.S. banking system now is sitting on about $1.7 trillion in unrealized losses. Why is that? Because as rates went up over the course of last year, the value of the bonds being held by these banks uh, went down significantly. Worse, on the long end of the curve, 30-year treasuries down to uh, 40%, but the, the point holds that across the board, banks are sitting on unrealized losses, if they can hold on to them till the end, when they mature, they're fine. If they're forced to sell, uh, they take losses, which depletes capital. The other big issue is that commercial real estate uh, as a market, as a sector, is really not looking good. So we've seen defaults and delinquencies rising. Banks really constitute the majority of this uh, nearly $6 trillion market, and especially the regional small banks. So they hold about 70% of all these loans. A lot of the outstanding loans are coming due. So 400 billion this year, 2.5 trillion, a real maturity wall in 2027. And the underlying issue here is they're just not getting rents. They're not getting tenants in their office uh, vacancies, especially on the coastal big cities. So San Francisco, LA, 21.6% vacancy rate, New York, 16% uh, vacancy rate. Focusing in on New York, this urban office space issue is really ground zero. Uh, Vernado is kind of the poster child for New York commercial real estate. They've had to do something completely unprecedented, which is suspend all dividend payouts for this year and talk about selling assets. Very difficult for a REIT where normally they are paying out 80% of their cash flow in the form of dividends. Uh, you see that even though the market as a whole is down 8%, real estate uh, down 21%, Vernado Renato down 64% uh, since the beginning of the year. So really, really uh, illustrating the problem. Again, going back to the banks, regional small banks are the most exposed to commercial real estate. Um, the big money center banks don't have that that much. It's not where the issue lies for them. 
But for a lot of these regional banks, including the ones we've been talking about, the exposure is pretty significant. Concentration in CRE uh, is very concerning. So we kind of summarize this now by saying you know, the bank crisis isn't over because we still have a deposit flight likely to ramp up again after the events of the last few days. Banks are uncompetitive with treasuries and money market funds. Uh, the banks are being forced to tap emergency lines at unprofitable uh, rates at an unprecedented pace. And uh, the underlying asset problem hasn't uh, been solved. So we've heard a lot from both government officials and the media to say, well, look, Silicon Valley, first Republic, these were unique situations. This isn't systemic. This isn't something that's going on across the sector. Uh, I don't think that's true. I think we're seeing a lot of the same risk exist, especially on what we've talked about, both uh, deposits on the liability side and then commercial real estate and investment securities on the asset side. This is a system a systemic problem. So I don't think this is going to end well. We're seeing deterioration again in the commercial real estate market. We've talked about these issues. Uh, bank profits will fall. Losses are going to increase. Capital will be depleted. The problem will spread. Federal Reserve is running out of options. They uh, are going to have to pivot, whether they do increase 25 basis points when they meet this week or not. Uh, they will have to turn to loosening monetary conditions. The FDIC is very challenged if this thing starts to spin out of control. We've got $17 trillion of deposits, as we showed earlier. The FDIC's DIF, the Deposit Insurance Fund, is 1% of that at $128 billion. Uh, they've already announced, FDIC, that they are estimating roughly $35.5 billion of losses to the fund from the three big failures that we've seen already. We'll see how that actually turns out when those asset sales come through. The regulators are running out of, out of tools. And I think the takeaway from this is the more frequently you hear them say everything is fine, the more concerned you should be. The credit crunch is coming. We're already seeing this as borrowing is going up. Banks are incurring losses. They're going to be forced to constrain lending. Credit squeeze across the board, but small and medium-sized businesses are the most severely impacted. Um, and we're going to see a, a deterioration in uh, economic conditions as we already saw here. So that, uh, that kind of sums it up. Not a lot of great news in this, uh, in this report. There's some very tough, tough messages. A lot of us are being forced to pay attention to a part of the world, their bank or the bank of the banking sector that isn't necessarily um, a place where you normally would pay attention. I think we're going to see the new cycle accelerate on this. We were, we were two days into the week. We had a very tough day in the market day as a result. I think we're going to see more the regional banks are really uh, tottering. And I think if we had the data, we'd see the deposit flight is resuming. So watch it, uh, stay close to it. We'll be back with updates on it. Again, if uh, you're watching on YouTube, if you could uh, like this, share it and subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back next time on Stormwall Advisors, hopefully with an update and maybe even some better news. Thanks everyone.